What's up everybody? Welcome back to the channel. I'm Mover C.W. Lemoyne and this is part one of my interview with Jolly Pilot, who you may know from both Instagram and uh, YouTube. Check his channel out. He is an Air Force HH-60 Pavehawk pilot and uh, in this two-part episode he's going to tell us what it's like uh, to be uh, a Pavehawk pilot, especially an Air National Guard Pavehawk pilot, uh, and also um, how he got started, his whole story and stuff. So I hope you enjoy this interview series. There's a lot of great videos. Uh, check out his channel, and uh, here we go. Three, two, one, flight off. So I'm here with Mike, uh, Jolly Pilot on YouTube. Uh, thanks for being on the channel. Thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, tell your story with uh, the viewers here. Um, first of all, how'd you get into flying, man? What what was the what made you get the bug? Sweet. Well, uh, thanks Boomer, for having me. I love your channel. I love your stuff. Thanks for reaching out. Um, happy to be on. I love what you do, bringing stuff to uh, to sort of everyone. You you know the battle with the DoD and and trying to get good content and get people to, to sort of do what we do. Um, as for the flying bug, uh, it hit from an early age. I think you're probably the same. I, I don't know many pilots who, who didn't get the bug pretty early on. I honestly couldn't, couldn't put on an exact spot, but even from a pretty young age, I knew I wanted to fly and I knew I wanted to fly in the military. So you started your entire career has been as an Air National Guard pilot. You went to pilot training knowing what you were gonna fly. How did you go through that process and get hired? And and what made you decide, hey, I don't want to be a fighter pilot or a rescue or a um, tanker pilot or t whatever. I want to be a helicopter pilot. How did you how did you get to that point? So starting with the guard, um, as you also well know, uh, the guard and the reserve are probably the best kept secret in the United States military. Uh, full disclosure: I actually did have ap active duty applications in, and uh, as soon as I found out about the guard, yeah, I was. Fun. As soon as I did that, I was like, I know what I want to do. I get to choose what I want to fly, where I want to fly it, and when I want to fly it. Absolutely. So uh, I dig on my active duty bros, but I think they all want to go to the guard <laughs> to do a fair amount of them that I meet are like, wait, that sounds awesome. So I uh, discovered the guard. Um, full disclosure again, I was actually pretty interested in helicopters or fighters. Um, I just kind of wanted to be in the mission. Uh, yeah. I always probably a little bit more of an inkling to helicopters than and fighters, but uh, I mean, I love the Hog, Viper, all all really cool platforms, and just to kind of be hacking the mission, uh, combat rescue. It, you know, we, we have a lot of different terms, and I won't get too nuanced here. We also use personnel recovery uh, as well as kind oh. of the new term for it. But uh, any of those those kind of work. So they hired you, and you went to uh, pilot training, knowing helicopters. So I'm going to go T6. You flew T6s, right? I'm assuming you're. Yep. Yeah. And then T sixes yeah, so to helos. It is a it is a pretty cool experience going in knowing your A, knowing where you're gonna fly in general, and B knowing that you're gonna fly helicopters, because quite frankly, the T six is kind of a bonus. You know, there's no yeah. real pressure. Um I tried to do well and and like to think I hopefully, you know, um represented my unit well, but quite frankly, it's just kind of fun to go there and rage around the T six awesome. and know that you're going to Port Rucker and that's part about it was uh, I know I was going to get out of Del Rio after six <laughs> months, which is right down the border. It's anyone who's been to Laughlin is well aware. Yeah. Well, uh, so you talked about Fort Rucker. That's an Army program, right? You're doing most of your training. How does that work out? Yeah. So for us, the, the guys who go the helicopter route, and I also like to, you know, certainly loop in active duty guys here because uh, my channel is kind of for everyone, anyone interested in Air Force helicopters. We don't get a ton of exposure. We don't have a demo team. Uh, you, you should. Really have it's Air really Force cool. Like the, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, we, we honestly probably don't have enough iron to do that these days, <laughs> but uh you know, you know, um, new Air Force problems. But anyway, you know, I like the community has been super supportive of me. You know, the deal, like, you know, I kind of expect a lot of flack from the guys for, you know, promoting this stuff. And, you know, it's a very fine line between self-aggrandizement and making the community look good because people relate through a personal story right. more than they do just Air Force rescue, you know, generic page. But at the same time, like, it is all about the community. I think folks who follow my page, like, I, I certainly keep a... A personal note to it, but uh, point being, I like to you know talk to active duty guys a lot as well. And for them, they uh, go through the T six, 
I know I'm going to Fort Rucker after those guys have to track select it. So they have mm-hmm. to choose between obviously fighters, heavies or helos, and they don't get a lot of exposure to it. So, um, if they do manage to make it, you end up with a class that's, you know, it could be really competitive, uh, cause you're growing five guys for one slot. So what I always tell them signal your interest early and often your flight commander, cause they'll work to get you slots from elsewhere. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Fort Rucker itself, it is, actually an air force program so even though it is on fort rucker mm-hmm. it is an air force squadron uh on the base itself we fly the huey which is just the coolest thing in the world kind of fun you fly night vision goggles we go out there we do low level uh you know right in the upt environment it's relaxed it's not the standard you know air force pilot training haze so it's uh it's good fun um it's the best time that i had in the military honestly uh and i you know, really close classes, um, great guys. And I think most guys really, really love it. Uh, how long is that pro or is it still pretty much 54 ish weeks from the time you start till the time you get your wings or does it take a little bit longer than, cause I know like our case, our C-130 guys, when they went to Kingsville, uh, or Corpus rather, it took them a little bit longer because they're on a different timeline than the standard track, you know, select guy from a T1 or T-38. Uh, it is a bit different um, just because you have that gap. You know, you have to give guys time to, to transit to Rucker. In the Guard Reserve, it can actually be a, a fairly extended period of time because our, you know, one of the downsides with the Guard, no one really talks about, it's a little bit more disjointed. You know, it, it's harder for them to get some resources that the active duty guys do, and it's not quite as stable. So uh, it is typically probably 13 to 14 months all said and done, but you know, it, it's not too far off from, uh, what guys going to fix wing route. And then where, have. where do you get your HH 60 qualification? Is it still at Fort Rucker or do you have to go somewhere else to get called in, in your aircraft? So 80% of what uh, guys get out of Fort Rucker, there's a couple different drops. If guys want to go fly Ospreys or, you know, special operations, they can uh, go do that route. Uh, also, the Huey soon to be replaced with the MH-139. I think it's called the Gray Wolf. Uh, it's oh, cool. essentially a utility. That sounds uh, cool. Yeah, it's a brand new platform. Uh, super cool. Lots of great avionics. Uh, it'll be fun to fly for those guys. And then there's a first assignment instructor pilots, but most everyone goes to Kirtland for their follow on. Uh, so that's out in New Mexico, Albuquerque. It's a fun town to go to. And, and it's kind of a cool dynamic because the same group of guys that you had at Fort Rucker all go out to Albuquerque. So you have a really tight class um, when you get out there and then you uh, go learn how to fly the Pavehawk. That's awesome. So tell me about the Pavehawk. How did, how did you like transitioning from a Huey to something, you know, more newer and more tactical? So the Paymock is awesome. Uh, there's a lot of nostalgia with the Huey. I'll be honest, if I was just going to go out for a Sunday ride, I think a lot of us would love to go take the Huey. With the fortunate sound. sun blare, blaring in the background? Yeah, I'd be the line if we, uh, every once in a while, don't splice in some audio you know, in the cockpit and, and listen to fortunate sun or, you know, awesome. certainly cut a couple of videos of uh, raging on the river. But uh, awesome. yeah, eventually we all get to the Paymock. The Paymock's a, a really amazing machine. Uh, it's been through a lot. It's seen a lot. Um, it is a tough bird. It is pretty fun to fly, um, especially the, the regimes that we operate in. At Kirtland, it's a little bit sluggish. It's kind of like a dump truck just because we're up so high. Yeah. Uh, you know, for you guys, uh, you know, we get nosebleeds about 500 feet. Uh, <laughs> HL. You know, if, if we go out to Kirtland, you know, you're up at six, seven, eight thousand feet, you know, at a little bit more altitude and uh, we get scared up there at helicopter guys. But uh, once you get it back to sea level, it is a blast to fly. It is uh, also some very, very challenging flying. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you know, you are always closer to the limit than you would like to be. The flying is just immensely fun. Like it is really when you're a kid and you think of flying, you know, you're like, hey, like, you know, I want to. When I grow up, I want to be a pilot. And you look at a bird out there, you know, just weaving yeah. its way through the trees or flaring to the landing. It is very much like that because speed is all perception. And the closer mm-hmm. to the ground you are, the faster it feels like you're going. And I mean, I'll let you jump in here, but I mean, Mach 1 at 40,000 feet probably looks no different than riding on an airliner. Just, just watching the needle and you're like, oh, there it is. Great. Yeah. And, and so for us, you know, yeah, we're going significantly slower, but when you're flying 50 feet off the ground, uh, we fly with the doors off too. So, but, uh, you know, you get that idea with the doors off, you know, if you're the pilot not flying, you can just stick your hand out the window. And I mean, it's like cruising in like a, you know, a old, you know, Porsche 356 on some windy back road, you know, it's super cool. And, um, we have 50 cows that we can mount forward and, 
you know, it's, it's fun to scare, you know, uh, first time co-pilots see that it's pretty fun to, uh, to scare them because you'll, you know, hear that thing rattling off right next to your ears, like the whole job. Have I you shot it? But the fine, immensely fun. I got to shoot it once. So we have fixed <laughs> forward fire capability. So, um, basically they mount forward and we have trigger controls up front. Like battlefield. Um, yeah, just like Battlefield. I mean, all those hours of, of playing in the Little Bird, you know, actually pay off down the road. You know, we use the TR method of aiming. It's a lot more scientific than that, but not really. Uh, but anyway, the, the flying is just really, really fun. Um, we also go do water work. So, you know, most people think 50, 100 feet, like that's low. When we go kilo cast our PJs in, so they jump out the doors, we get right down to 10 feet at night over the water. You know, obviously you're not going particularly fast, but, um, you know, at that point you're actually literally looking out for waves. Like if there's a decent swell, like you have to keep your eye out and at night, you know, on night vision goggles at 10 feet, you know, you're just in this, you know, hellacious spray. So, wow. um, you know, it, that's, that's maybe a little more on the scary than fun side, but, uh, you know, during the day when we do helo cast, there's nothing cooler than you're down a little riverbed. Uh, the doors are off. You're getting like a light mist in the cockpit. The guys are jumping out the back. So it's, it's super cool. And you really feel like you're flying an aircraft. It is just immensely fun. So the most air force question I'll ever ask on this channel, does it have air conditioning or does it get really hot? Uh, funny you mention that. So, uh, being the most air force thing as well, the air force <laughs> and uh, helicopters don't get along. So no, we didn't actually get air conditioning. They're like, Oh, well, those guys are basically ground pounders. You know, they're <laughs> on the um, in all seriousness, uh, that is actually, uh, pretty, I wouldn't say it's a complaint. Like, you know, it doesn't keep me up at night, but, uh, when you're flying in the heat of Africa or Iraq, yeah. um, and you know, even with the doors off, it doesn't help when it is, I used to look at the outside air temperature gauge on the 60 when I was first learning and went up to 50, which is 126 degrees Fahrenheit. I was thinking to myself, I was like, wait, why does this gauge go so high? I, I mean, surely, you know, I'll never need that. And I remember three years later, I'm, I'm sitting in a, you know, a warm, sunny vacation location. Let's just say it, call it that. And, uh, Armor, you know, so we're wearing armor, you know, you have, you know, M4 mags on your chest, you know, you have a helmet on, you know, you're kilted up and or kitted up, I should say. And uh, we're flying along and I am just roasting. I look up and that gauge is pegged. So it was higher than 50 degrees. Oh my God. And when we landed, um, yeah, I looked at my vest and I had a really odd sweat line <laughs> at the risk of getting into too much detail. Yeah. And, uh, at the time I was flying left and my whole left side of me is completely dry. And the right side is soaked oh. it's from the door off. It's basically an oven. So at that stage, even with the door off, even with the air circulating and it's 126 degrees out, you just like roasting in an oven. So, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have air conditioning, unfortunately, and it does get extremely hot. So what about heat? It, I mean, Alaska. Uh, so another, another interesting, <laughs> thing. our heat works great in the front. So for the pilots, okay. we have phenomenal heat to the point of being too hot. Okay. And then our poor flight engineers or, you know, special mission aviators in back, you know, they're, they're back there, you know, hacking the mission, like opening doors, you know, they have terrible heat. And, oh, uh, so they're like more heat, more heat, more heat. And we're sitting up front, like, uh, you know, I'm not going to open my mouth and say that it's too hot because I know how cold they are, but you know, they're, they're freezing and we're just roasting up front, especially if you get the sun. So, uh, let's just say that the climate control system, the 60 was not the primary concern when they designed it. Do you I, wear uh, the, the cool mask? Uh, so you can, I have one. Um, it, there's actually a, there's two reasons for it. One, it keeps the winds. Mm -hmm. off of the microphone. So if you're flying with the doors off, you know, especially our flight engineers, it keeps that off. The other one is in helicopter crashes. What actually typically happens is people's face get messed up because they, uh, like either when it goes down, someone swings forward or most bullets come through the, you know, the dashboard or the windshield and they frag it, uh, and turn that essentially into debris. And so if your face isn't exposed, a lot of that will come wow. up and, you know, get you in the neck wherever else. That's why a lot of guys wear those. Huh. I didn't know any of that stuff. So tell me about the mission of the Pavehawk in the Air Force. I think people don't really understand. I know there was a National Geographic series, which is what got me interested in it, where they talked about the Pedros and uh, rescue. Um, what is the overall mission set of helicopters in the Air Force? 
you are not the only one. A uh, good little title for this uh, video quip would be, wait, the Air Force has helicopters? <laughs> I'm uh, using that. I'm already stealing it. Thank I, you. <laughs> the perfect, you know, the perfect, we all got to have the kind of quick baby titles yeah. on YouTube to, to get the interest. And uh, you'd be surprised how many people in the Air Force don't actually know that we have helicopters. I'd say 50% of my pilot training class when I showed up, they're like, you're going to fly. What? Like, <laughs> oh, you helicopters, what? like, you know, combat <laughs> rescue. Like, uh, no, no, we didn't, didn't really know that. Like, we, you guys were like shot at and stuff. Or like, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, anyway, it's kind of the broad scope why we exist. Uh, you know, in simplistic terms, it's basically to go get like guys like you or guys, you know, pressing down on the fight out. That was our traditional mission set. Combat, search and rescue. It's actually uh, stretches all the way back to World War II with PBY, Catalinas, rescuing oh, guys cool. out of the Pacific Theater. But the advent of the helicopter... Yeah, it's, it's, it is a sort of long and storied history. Um, as we get closer to Korea and Vietnam, the advent of the helicopter enabled us to pick people up over land. So that was a, a sort of a revolution uh, at the time. I'd say most folks really knew we came into existence in Vietnam with mm. the uh, Super Jolly Greens, the Jolly Greens, uh, the HH-43. Uh, and there's some really, really great books on that for those interested. You know, we can sort of talk about those later. But... Uh, essentially, it was the guys in your thuds, your F-4s, any of your fighter aircraft, if they were shot down, it was the job of the Jolly Greens to go in and get them. The uh, Jolly Green call sign came from just a big green helicopter, yeah. and our uh, traditional, I think I got the mug over my shoulder, mm -hmm. came from you know PJs coming down on the hoist into the forest with notionally green feet. So that was the origin. Um, it is now morphed more broadly into personnel recovery. Mm -hmm. So what you saw in Inside Combat Rescue, uh, obviously, and fortunately, pilots aren't getting shot down these days. Let's hope it stays that way. But uh, as a result, um, we have transitioned to Kazovac and Medivac. So that yeah. is, is what you traditionally think of in Vietnam is, you know, your Red Cross choppers come in. It's a mission that we, we also share with the Army, but uh, we maintain both mission sets. I would argue that the Combat Rescue and CSAR Jolly Green mission set is a little bit more dynamic and potentially challenging, you know, pushing way into you know, enemy territory, if you like, versus Medivac, which is much more... Um, of a, a, less hostile, right? I mean, you guys, are, you have PJs on board, you have guys that are snake eaters in the back that can actually fight your way in, right? It's more of a, a self-contained way to get in the bad guy land. Absolutely. And, and that's where we picked up from the army is that we have our own weapons on board. So notionally we can self escort. Um, and also, you know, that's not to diminish what guys have been doing in Afghanistan, Iraq for years. Yeah. It may not be pushing into downtown Tehran, but uh, oh, we have taken a lot a lot of battle damage over the years. Uh, unfortunately, we lost some really great guys, and uh, you know, it is a pretty noble mission and rewarding. And uh, you know, I, I think that really made a name for Air Force Rescue in the past twenty years. It got on a lot more people's radar. Wow! As your careers progressed, how has have people kind of started to respect it more as they've seen kind of what you've done in Afghanistan and deployments? Have they, has the mentality towards you changed a little bit over the time that you've been flying? Yeah, I think it's been dual faceted in that we have gotten more talent. A lot of folks didn't know about uh, the fact the Air Force had helicopters, but basically there wasn't a lot of representation at UPT bases for helicopters. So, you know, it's kind of looked down on. Um, that is not good because the flying we do is really challenging and we do really need to attract talent uh, to keep our helicopters out of the dirt. But as uh, you know, we've sort of proven ourselves to the community, if you like, or I wouldn't even go as far as to say proven, but just gotten a lot of visibility over the last 20 years, I would absolutely say that respect level has changed. We've had fighter guys transition to the guard, come fly helicopters with us. They love it. You know, it, there's folks don't really look down on it. But I think most folks in the Air Force now kind of appreciate what we do. And quite frankly, as a, a fighter guy, you ought to have an appreciation of what we do, because if you find yourself on the ground, um, Air Force Combat Rescue is hopefully the ones coming to get you. Yeah, absolutely. So there are other missions too, right? Um, at Cocoa Beach, they work with, uh, obviously SpaceX is happening. It's in the news. They're doing, they're working directly with NASA for these launches off the Cape Canaveral, right? Aren't they helping out with, uh, with those, that squadron down there? You're absolutely right. The 920th Rescue Wing uh, covers down on SpaceX, and they actually used to do all of the manned spaceflight missions. 
a little bit of a rainbow mission. So rainbow is we use in the military means you take different units from yeah. different states and cover it. Uh, I know New York used to cover down on some of the, uh, the Patrick missions. Uh, but overarchingly, that's one of the really cool things about the Garden Reserve is that you have two missions. Your federal mission, so we were just talking about uh, combat search and rescue and personnel recovery, but we also have several uh, civilian SAR, civil SAR missions, as we call it. Yeah. Uh, Alaska maintains a 24-7 alert. So there's the uh, Air National Guard unit up there. Oh, cool. 24-7 alert. Uh, they do. Yeah, it's a, it's a really intense mission. I had a chance to fly with those guys for a couple of weeks. Really impressive group. Uh, obviously, wow. the weather up there is some of the worst in the world. Yeah. And uh, they'll go out to get hikers, plane crashes, you name it. Um, they'll do some long over water missions. California Air Guard and both the New York Air Guard as well uh, do long range offshore civil SAR missions. So the Coast Guard doesn't have the ability to aerial refuel. So their range obviously is limited by how much fuel. Uh, they can carry. And that's good for, you know, probably 98% of the missions that they need to do. However, if there is somebody just far enough offshore in the middle of the Pacific, the middle of the Atlantic, uh, they'll call Air Force Rescue, typically the Guard, although active duty guys definitely pick up some of these missions from time to time. Awesome. And uh, we'll go out there a couple hundred miles offshore and uh, and pick somebody up. It's uh, It's pretty interesting to be, you know, air to air refueling is pretty uh, developed or, or uh, it's pretty consistent on the fixed wing side of the house for us. I'm yeah. not going to say it's not consistent, but uh, it is a little bit different of an experience. And uh, for anyone who's watched the perfect storm, uh, there was a air force rescue helicopter lost during the perfect storm uh, for exactly that. They couldn't get on the hose. Did now you actually have a video of you refueling uh, in a helicopter. Tell me about that. Like what, what is, what is going on? Uh, you know, with that, how, how slow does a tank, does a tanker have to be in order to refuel and how fast do you have to go? I mean, you're having to push it up and he's having to slow down, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a very interesting dance. If you like, uh, I'll just start by saying everything else I saw in the military very much started as, you know, it looked insane. And then with more training, more time, it became, you know, pretty normal. Like the first time you find <laughs> fingertip formation, you look over and there's an aircraft there. And you're like, whoa, what's that guy doing there? And <laughs> Get away. After a while, you, yeah, yeah, stay away from me. You know, I, I, I want my space. But, uh, you know, you get used to it after a time and, and it becomes pretty normal. Uh, helicopter air-to-air refueling is the only thing I have done. And uh, I know there's other folks in the community that feel it's the same way that never quite gets less insane. Like, you, wow. you're kind of like, where you do it, you're like, why am I this close to a, you know, a <laughs> giant, you know, hundred thousand pound gas tank in the sky with a lot of rotating, you know, the, there's four props in the C-130. We're doing it simultaneously so on, on either stuff. side. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, there's some videos out there for, for folks who look that will, uh, that will definitely see some interesting moments. I'll just say, and there's some ones that have never seen the light of the day as well. The boom is on the right side. So is it only the right side or does the, is the left seater actually refuel too? So we did it both sides. So the video I, I sent you was, uh, back with flying as a co-pilot. Um, this is sort of back in 2014, 15, when I was up in Alaska and, uh, it, you can do it from both sides. Doing it from the left side is much harder because yeah. you get that that sort of parallax. You're looking across, you know, cockpit, and it, it definitely creates some interesting illusions, uh, especially at night. Um, typically, the ideal is to have the guy on the right side doing it um, first. <laughs> wow. So on that note, in helicopters, the right seater is the aircraft commander. Left seater, you guys call the co-pilot. How does that upgrade process work? And at that point, how do you decide who is doing which role for which mission? Yeah, so you're absolutely correct. So the, the pilot progression is you start as a co-pilot, you sit left seat. Um, we are somewhat seat agnostic. So like an, an instructor pilot or flight lead um, can always fly on the left side. So, you know, for myself, I've done both sides. You know, for me, it doesn't really matter what seat I'm sitting in. I personally prefer the right seat. Uh, just because of the sort of the visual illusions and stuff. But right. if I was flight leading, sometimes I like last seat just due to some certain uh, control configurations. And the important thing for us, one of our challenges, it's unlike a fighter, the uh, interface or the ergonomics are not particularly, I'm not going to say not well thought out, but they're just going to all put in there. So, you know, at night you're flipping up your goggles, leaning over your oh. shoulder, you know, as you're 50 off the ground, trying to, you know, flip some switch. So it, it definitely does matter, but uh, you go from co-pilot to aircraft commander. 
Aircraft commander just means you are in charge of that one helicopter. Uh, from aircraft commander, you get a flight lead. We typically operate with two helicopters. So now you are the aircraft commander and the lead aircraft, and you are also controlling the formation. Uh, from there, you go instructor, pilot, evaluator. Uh, it, the process can take anywhere from uh, four to six years uh, to operate through the whole process. Is there so the A10s have a Sandy One qual uh, that interfaces with you guys? Is there an equivalent? like a mission commander to do a Sandy role or to do uh, to integrate with the A-10s or is it always the A-10s or the Sandy and you guys just kind of integrate with that? So that's a great question. Our community has really switched. So we, we used to do a lot of Sandy led CSAR. And for those who don't know, um, the A-10 is a really capable platform when it comes to combat search and rescue. Uh, they're an incredible platform in general. We work with them a lot. Uh, you know, it's really fun. And for us, quite frankly, it's a, it's a nice warm and fuzzy to have those guys over your shoulder. They are, you know, you call out defensive on something, you know, meaning you're, you're getting shot at. And, you know, before you can even look, they're in guns blazing. One awesome. of the, you know, just we're talking about fun flying. There's nothing cooler. You're down at 50 feet out over the uh, the knitter, the Nellis training range. Doors off. You know, you call like, "Hey, defensive." And you look over your shoulder, and there's a you know low angle straight from an A10 down there at oh. 100 feet. And you guys are so cool. You know, working with those guys is great. Um, they really kind of understand the mission. But unfortunately, you know, the, the military certainly has only so many resources to go around. So we train uh, to the rescue mission um, commander level, or we try, you know, okay. we, as a very specific qual um, and, you know, guys have to earn that qual. So we, we are very careful about not calling yourself an RMC, but trying to be able to assume some of those responsibilities. And uh, it is not an independent qual that just comes with flight leads. So our flight leads are really expected to be able to affect the recovery um, and quite frankly, sometimes the A-10s can't get under the weather. There, there are a lot of different scenarios right. where your flight lead has to be able to go um, affect a recovery of a downed aviator. All right. That'll do it for part one of my interview with Jolly Pilot. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned for part two, uh, where we talk more about his career and what it's like flying helicopters in the Air Force. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks for watching. If you're looking for a book to check out, uh, Absolute Vengeance, the Alex Shepard series, is uh, on sale, 99 cents for the month of June. So uh, pick that up. That starts the Alex Shepard series, uh, and I hope you'll enjoy it for your summer reading. Uh, if you're looking for a charity to support, Folds of Honor. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Excuse me. Oh, no. Fly with the doors off. All box Don't be a douche. Rule number one. Make them tell you no.